Amen. Please be seated. It is good to see all of you here this day. And as we come to the Word of God, I invite you please to turn with me in your copy of the Scripture to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, as we come to take up the glorious theme of the great source and security of our salvation, please notice with me what we read, picking up in verse 3 of this chapter, and I'll read to verse 6 in your hearing. Philippians chapter 1, at verse 3, here as Paul puts forth his personal prayer for the Philippians, he writes the following and says, Philippians 1, at verse 3, he writes saying, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Well, dear brothers and sisters here today, let's once again pray and ask the Lord's blessings upon our time. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful that we could gather this day in your house to consider your things. We're so thankful, O oh God, for the Word of God. For indeed it is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces deep within, it convicts, it conforms, and it converts. O oh God, it does many wonderful things in the lives of people. And Father, as we come this day to your word, we're asking that you would give us a fresh help from on high. We're asking, O oh God, even as we sang a few moments ago, that the Holy Ghost would attend the ministry of the preached word. We ask, O oh God, that he would come with power and give help to all of us in this place this day. O oh God, we are mindful that a man can receive nothing except it be given to him from above. And so we're asking, O oh great God, that you would give it to us this day in copious measures. Give us all that we need for our lives as the people of God. Lord, we ask that you would encourage us in the way, that you would help us and strengthen us who know you through Christ. And for those who don't know you here this day, O oh God, we're asking that this would be the day of salvation. We ask, O oh God, that you would bring some out of a state of alienation and rebellion to you into the orbit of salvation and adoption into your wonderful family. O oh God, come we pray. Do us all good. We ask and pray these things in and through that wonderful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The story is told about an old minister who was once asked whether he believed in the final perseverance of the saints, to which he answered saying, well, I don't know much about that matter, but I firmly believe in the final perseverance of God, so that where he has begun a good work in a person, he will most certainly bring it to completion. Now, dear brothers and sisters here this day, it has been correctly said that although man can disappoint, God never does. And it has been correctly said that although man does not always complete what he starts, God always does. Now, brethren here this day, this is good news to be sure. This is very comforting news for you and I who are believers, and this especially when it comes to the work of salvation which God in grace has wrought in our hearts. Well, we come for this morning to a, a passage of Scripture which plainly points us in this direction. Here, as Paul in the opening words of Philippians chapter 1 is expressing thanks to God concerning the Philippians, his thoughts in verse 6 of this chapter turn towards the great confidence 
that he had in the Almighty God and his ability to finish what he began in them. Here Paul says to the Philippians and to you and us who are Christians here in this place by way of extension, that even though at times our lives as Christians will be difficult and we will have many setbacks, etc., dear ones, nonetheless, the glorious good news of the Bible is that ultimately you and I do not keep ourselves to the end. No, but rather you and I are kept by the power of God till the final day even as the Apostle Peter says in chapter 1 of his book. This, dear brethren, here this morning is the fact of the matter, so that while not at all denying the glorious doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, you and I must never forget that we are not in this race alone. We must never forget, listen, we must never forget that by the power of the Holy Spirit, God Almighty will infallibly, inevitably, and invincibly bring us home to himself. Glory be to his name. Now, this, of course, is what our own London Baptist Confession of Faith teaches. This is the case, consequently. This is why the writers in it could say, that although many storms and floods in this life will arise and beat against us, we will nonetheless certainly be kept by the power of God for salvation. The writers say that this is the case, and the reason for this is because we who are true Christians are engraved on the palms of God's hands and our names have been written in the book of life from all eternity. Well, again, beloved ones here this day, as I said a moment ago, this is very encouraging truth for us. This is extremely heartening, especially in view of the fact that at times you and I can feel like we are just about at the end of our rope. At times we can feel like we just can't go on anymore because we're so beaten down by the world and the flesh and the devil, etc. Ah, but beloved friends, I say to you this day that if this is how you're feeling, you must always remember that ultimately you are not fueling yourself for this race, but God is. You must always remember underscore it, mark it down, highlight it if you will. You must always remember that the strength that you need to finish well as a child of God is not ultimately in yourself, no, for it comes from the Lord who will continue to give it to you all of your days. Praise be to his name. And so, as we come then, for this morning to our passage which highlights some of these things to us, I ask you please to notice with me first in your copy of the scriptures in 6a of this chapter, the work of salvation commenced. The work of salvation commenced. Here, as the Apostle Paul <clears throat> approaches this subject, he writes saying again, look at the words with me in your Bibles, he says, being confident of this very thing. Now, as we begin our exposition of this verse, you should note that these words here which begin by saying, being confident, are one word in the Greek text which come to us as a perfect tense verb. And so you ask, what does this mean? Well, the perfect tense verb in Greek speaks about a present state, or we might say a present condition, based on a past action. And so what then does this tell us? Well, what it tells us is that as Paul here was writing to the Philippians, about 10 years later from the very first day that they were saved, he says to them that just as the case was then, so also now he was just as convinced 10 years later that their salvation was 100% secure. You see here, the tense of the verb tells us that Paul's confidence 
concerning this whole matter was a settled conviction for him even to this present time. And it was, as he says here, look at the language, with reference to a certain matter which he calls in our text this very thing. And so we ask, what was the very thing which the Apostle Paul had an unshakable persuasion about? Well, the next word in our verse, which is the word that, answers this question as the conjunction here puts forth the content of Paul's confidence. Here he says that he's 100% sure of this very thing, and that very thing which he was 100% sure of was concerning the fact, look at the language, that, here's the content, he who had begun a good work in the Philippians would complete it. Now, the first question that we need to ask and answer here is who is the he in our verse. Well, quite clearly, even though Paul doesn't say it here, quite clearly, as the context shows us, it is God who is the he in the verse, as I said a moment ago. My dear ones, this makes a perfect sense, especially since in the context, in verse 3 of this chapter, Paul is making his direct address to the Lord himself. And so follow with me. Here is the apostle. Thanks God not only for his remembrance of the Philippians and thanks God for their partnering with him in the gospel, as he says in the previous words. He says here also that he's thankful to God for the fact that he, having begun a good work in them, would complete it. Ah, but having said this, we need to ask next, what exactly is the good work which God had begun in these people? Well, while certainly, uh, certainly, this could be a reference to the good work of partnering with Paul in the support and the spread of the gospel, as he says in verse 5 of this chapter, it seems better to me, dear ones here this day, and to many others, that we understand Paul's words here concerning God beginning a good work in the Philippians as a reference to the entire work of salvation from the beginning to the end, extending from their initial regeneration all the way to their final glorification. I mean, here, Paul does not speak about a good work that God did through them, no. Uh, nor does he speak about a good work that God did among them, no. Rather, look at the words in your Bibles. He speaks about a good work which God began in them. And so, simply stated, if you're taking notes, here's the summary statement. The good work here in view is the work of grace which God alone initiates in the heart of his people. Now, concerning this matter of God alone doing this, this is a vital, or I might say a crucial point for you and I as the people of God to always remember. Uh, this is the case, and I say this because unfortunately there are some in our day who miss this. Uh, there are some in our day who not only miss this, but reject this point altogether. I mean, there are some who believe, for example, that they came to God of their own so-called free will. They believe that the work of salvation began when they, quote, accepted Jesus Christ as their own personal Lord and Savior. All but beloved ones here this day, I say that this is not what Paul teaches in our passage. Uh, this is not what the Bible teaches in any place. Uh, no, rather, Paul teaches us here that it is God and God alone who begins, who initiates, who consummates the work of salvation in us. He, he teaches that it's God who is the sole author and source, there's your heading in my title, 
sole author and sole source of our salvation. Thus, this is why, if you're taking notes, for example, Paul could say in Philippians 2 and verse 13 that it is God who works in you. And so again, my dear brethren here this day, I say that you and I must never forget this point. We must never forget that it is God and God alone who first breathes life into dead sinners and this so that afterwards they could respond to the overtures of the gospel. This is always, underscore it, always the order of things. God begins the work. This is always the order of things. Consequently, this is why we're told, for example, in Acts chapter 16, concerning Lydia. Lydia, who was one of the founding members of this very church. What are we told about Lydia in Acts chapter 16? Well, we're told there that the Lord, not Lydia, no, but that the Lord opened her heart. He first opened her heart and this, so that afterward she could heed the things which were spoken by Paul. Now we do well to ask next, why is it that salvation, as I have described it in our verse for this morning, why is it that salvation here is described in our passage as a good work? Why is that the case? Well, while I'm sure, no doubt, that many answers could be given to the question, clearly this is the case because when God supernaturally does the work of salvation in the hearts of individuals, he makes them brand new creations in Christ Jesus, and that's a good work to be sure, amen? That is a, a glorious work. That is an outstanding work. Uh, further, uh, this is a good work because regardless of how that individual is living before they were saved. And now, however, because of God's great grace towards them, the individual who has been converted by the free grace of God begins to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age, even as Paul says in Titus chapter 2. Well, praise be to God then, brethren, for this good work which he alone initiates in the hearts of sinners, right? Yes, praise be to God that salvation is God's most glorious work. It is his most beautiful work of which he alone gets all the credit. Now, there is another thought here regarding this whole matter at hand. And follow with me as I say it. There is another matter. And it is that since salvation is completely a work of God, he begins the work in us. You and I must always remember that none of us could ever produce a good work in and of ourselves in order to make ourselves right with God. It's his work, not ours. But we must remember, again, as you, you look at the words, he begins the work. What does that mean? It means we have no work which could commend ourselves to God. You see, church, salvation is not a human effort. It's not a, a human work. It's not done by our strivings. No, and why is this? Well, it's because all of our strivings, all of our efforts to please the Almighty God, all of these things are tainted with sin. Thus, they are not pleasing to the Almighty. It's because for us to be accepted before the perfect God of the Bible, we would have to live a perfect life before Him. And so what's the problem with this? Well, I think you know the problem without me answering the question. The problem is none of us have lived a perfect life in thought, word, and in deed before the Almighty God. Oh, the problem is, according to the Bible, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, you and I must be punished for our sins before this God. And so this is the bad news of the Bible. Ah, but the good news is, listen carefully, there is a work which gets us into heaven. There is one work 
and one work only, which God completely accepts in the place of believing sinners, and that work is the finished work of Jesus Christ the Lord, who 2,000 years ago died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. You see, beloved, at the cross, Jesus fully paid the penalty for our sins, and this by shedding his blood in our place. Glory be to his name. And so while all of our works are faulty and full of sin, there is a work which commends us to God. It's the finished work of Jesus Christ when he died as the just one for the unjust ones that he might bring them to God. Oh, I say this is a glorious work. This is the work and the work alone which commends us to God. Thus, that's why when our Lord died, he cried out saying, not to be continued, no, but rather he cried out saying, it is done. Another perfect tense verb, it stands completed. It was completed 2,000 years ago at the cross and the benefits of his completed work go on for all eternity. It is done. It stands accomplished. And so, having seen in 6a of this chapter, the work of salvation commence. Come with me now secondly to note in 6b of this chapter the work of salvation completed. The work of salvation completed. Here as Paul shows us in truth that what God begins, he always finishes. He writes next in our verse saying, look at the words with me there in your Bibles, he writes, being confident, or again we might say being totally convinced of this very thing, that he again God, who has begun a good work in you, notice the next word, will, not might, not, not perhaps, but he will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, the word complete here means uh, to finish. Uh, the word means to accomplish. And this verb is in the future tense, and it plainly points to the fact that the work of salvation which God began in our lives, he will absolutely perfect it one day. Now, of course, having just said what I just did, this completely comes against that most wicked, that most horrid, that most unscriptural doctrine which some people hold to, which teaches that a truly saved, born again, justified individual could somehow become unjustified and lost in the final analysis. I mean, brethren, there are actually some who teach and believe that a true child of God could be lost in the final analysis. I, I guess for them, they believe that someone who is uh, born again could become unborn again or something like this. But brethren, I say, this is complete nonsense. This is completely anti-scriptural. For it absolutely denies what the Bible says in so many places. So many places. This is false teaching 101. And I say this because the Bible says to us, for example, in that most famous verse of all, John 3 and verse 16, what does it say? Jesus speaking says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Partial life? No. A, a temporal life? No. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that has gave him to be a sacrifice for our sins that everyone believing literally into him resting in him alone for life and salvation. Everyone who believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Not partial life, but everlasting life. In fact, dear ones, our Lord Jesus Christ even confirmed this perspective. For in John 6, in verse 39, he says, this is the will of the Father who sent me. Well, Jesus, tell us what that will is. This is the will of him who sent me, 
that of all that he has given to me, I shall lose nothing. Not a one, says Jesus. Oh, but the Arminian says yes. But Jesus says no. Oh, but the free willers and, and everybody else, they say, oh, you can lose your salvation. Um, Jesus says, all that the Father has given me, I'm not going to lose one of them, but I will surely raise them up in the last day. Well, on and on I can go with texts like these. But I trust, dear Grace Community Baptist Church, that all of you are convinced of this matter already. I trust that you're absolutely sure with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 when in using the same Greek verb as we have it here in the beginning of our verse in Philippians says in Romans chapter 8 that he was persuaded or more literally he was completely confident what were you completely confident of Paul that Again, the conjunction giving us the content of his confidence. I am fully persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, Paul says, you name it, nor any other created thing shall be able, or more literally, shall have the power to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, uh, dear ones here this day, this seems pretty straightforward to me. I mean, this is the case, and I say that in view of it, here is where our great comfort as Christians is to be found. Here is where our great security is to be had. God having saved us will keep us saved to the end. Here is where our great enjoyment is to come as the people of God in view of all that we'll face in life. As Paul said in Acts chapter 14, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. That's how it goes. It's a rough world. Many difficulties on the right and on the left, but the good news of the Bible is God having saved us will keep us saved to the end. God having begun a good work in us will complete it to the end. And all of this is based upon God's character, God's covenant, and the work of God's Son on our behalf. Well, when the Apostle says, finally here in our text in view, that God, having begun the good work of salvation in us, will complete it, look at the language, until the day of Jesus Christ our Lord. What is he speaking of? Well, clearly he's speaking about that final aspect of our salvation, which is called glorification. And this will happen when our Lord returns to this earth. For at that time, you and I, with the Philippians will receive glorified bodies. This is what Paul is referring to here when he speaks about the day of Jesus Christ. This is the second coming of our Lord. And this is because on that day Jesus will return and resurrect our bodies if they've died at that point. And then, according to the same book in Philippians 3 and verse 21, Jesus will, quote, transform our lowly bodies so that they might be conformed into his glorious body according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. Well, church, what a glorious day that's going to be, right? This will be the day when that which is mortal will put on immortality and this will be the day when the saying will be brought to pass which says that death is swallowed up in victory consequently you and I will be able to say oh death where is your sting oh grave 
Where is your victory? And so here then is where we end the exposition of this wonderful, glorious, encouraging text which speaks to us about the great source, namely God, and security of our salvation. Here is the apostle, continues to put forth his personal pastoral prayer for the Philippians. He speaks about his great confidence in God and his great ability to complete the work of grace which he began in us. And so, having considered our topic for today, what applications can you and I take for ourselves who are the people of God in this place? To us who have been saved by the grace of God, what does our passage call us to? Well, there were three things. There were three things. And the first is to praise, because what God begins, he always completes. The second is to perseverance, so that you and I do all that we can do to keep ourselves in the way of righteousness and truth. And then the third is to prayer. And this not only for ourselves, no, but for all of the people of God in this place, that they would arrive into glory in good shape. So, three applications growing out from our passage. Number one, it's to praise. It's to praise. Why? Because what God begins, He always completes. You see, dear ones, we can never say of ourselves, being confident of this very thing, that having begun salvation by myself, my own effort, my own free will, I will be able to keep myself to the end. No. Again, Paul earlier, he thanks God for the uh, Philippians in remembrance of them, verse 3. In verse 5, he thanks the Philippians for partnering with him in the gospel. But when it comes to salvation and us getting to heaven in the final analysis, he's not thanking God for the Philippians or thanking the Philippians themselves. No, he's thanking God directly. Because God and God alone has the ability to keep his people to the end. And so again, as I think about my own life and you think about your life and how weak you are and how, how weak I am and all of the trials that we uh, face and how much we, we falter and how weak we are. Uh, sometimes the Christian life is like uh, uh, one step forward and, and four steps backwards. This is the Christian life. It's difficult at times. And we wonder, am I going to make it, oh God? The temptation is so rough. It's so hard. It's so difficult. Uh, so many things on the right and on the left. Oh God, will I make it to the end? Dear brother, dear sister, you will for sure. And all of this is based on the keeping power of God. Jesus says, the Gospels tell us, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. And that's how it is for you, my dear brother, my dear sister here this day. You say, oh, pastor, but I fall so many times. The same sin keeps tripping me up time and time again, friend. Keep repenting of that same sin. And keep coming to God as his child, owning the sin and believing the gospel. That if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Remember, dear daughter of God here this day, dear son of God here this day, that God, in the covenant of redemption, the covenant he made with his son from before the foundation of the world. He gave his son a people to die for. And all for whom Christ died will get to glory at last. No questions asked. No doubt about it. 
being fully persuaded of this very thing, that he who has begun the good work of salvation in you will complete it till the day that Jesus returns. And so if I was an Arminian, God forbid, but if I was, I don't know how I could have any joy in life, any satisfaction thinking that this sin might knock me out of the Christian race or this thing might uh, uh, bring God's uh, uh, cutting of me off. I, I, just, I just couldn't imagine it. But understanding that God having saved me will keep me saved to the end, that surely, of course, if I sin, He will chase me and all the rest, but He chases me as a loving Heavenly Father. He chastens me for my good so that I may learn His ways and be more and more obedient. But God never cuts off those for whom His Son has died. No, those for whom Jesus died, they get into heaven in the final analysis. And this is why we must continually say in this place, to God be the glory. God is to be praised. God is to be worshipped. Because of so many things, but especially because of his keeping power in our lives. But secondly, I believe there is this note to be sounded that you and I are to persevere in our walk with God so that we do all that we can, humanly speaking, to keep ourselves in the way of righteousness and truth. You see, the Bible doesn't only teach the final preservation of the saints by God, but it also teaches, as I said earlier, the perseverance of the saints of God. God will keep his people to the end, no question about it. But the Bible also talks about us keeping ourselves in the way of righteousness. Many, many places speak about this, that we have a work to do. God works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We are to work out what God works in us through the process of sanctification. Justification is all the work of God. Glorification is all the work of God. The two bookends to our salvation, ah, but in between there is a work in which we cooperate with God, and it's called the work of sanctification. That's why we're called to mortify the deeds of the flesh by the Holy Spirit. This is why Jude says, keeping yourselves in the love of God. And so we have a work to do as Christians. We're not passive. Oh, God's going to keep me to the end. So I'm just going to coast in my life. Not going to read my Bible. Not going to pray. Not going to be a church. Not going to mortify the deeds of the flesh by the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. We must do all that God calls us to do. Because in this, we work with God in our sanctification. In this, we keep good consciences before the Lord God Almighty. And so we are to persevere as believers. For many, many reasons. Most of them are personal reasons. We need to strive to enter in every day of our lives into the narrow way which leads to life. God, God has put us there by conversion. So in that sense, we might say we've got to really fight to stay in the narrow way. So many outside matters always are trying to draw us off to, to the left and to the right whether they be a family members or, 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 or films or, or, or music or, or our own hearts. Or so many things seeking to get us out of the way of holiness. And this will happen time and again in our lives. And so what do we do? We repent of our sins. We confess them to God. Oh God, here I am again. Forgive me for this sin. Oh God, cleanse me afresh in the blood of Christ. And what does God do? He doesn't put us in the penalty box. No, he receives us. He continues to receive us time and time again. Why? Because the Bible says the blood of Jesus cleanses from A-L-L, sin, all sin. And it continues to cleanse us time and again as we confess our sins to God. Does this mean that we go on sinning willfully so that God's grace may abound? I say with Paul, God forbid, may it never be. If you're a true child of God here this day, let me say to you, dear friend, 
then you hate to sin. You, you hate to sin. True Christians hate to sin. I'm not saying they don't find any momentary pleasure in it, but they hate to sin. They don't want to sin anymore. Their relationship to sin has been severed. Why? Because of their relationship with the Savior. And once a person is put in union with Jesus Christ, the Holy One of God, they find it very hard to pursue sin. Oh, they do it sometimes, I know. Because there's still remaining corruption in them. But that's not their heart's desire. Uh, that is not the, the pattern and the disposition of their life. So that when they sin, they feel grief. Uh, they are ashamed of the things of which they've done. They come to God saying, oh Lord, again I've messed up. Forgive me. I want your, your benediction to be upon me. I, I, I want your, your good smile to be upon me. Oh God, forgive me. And again, as we come clean before God, He always forgives His children. And then He renews in them fresh measures of repentance and faith and gospel obedience to the things of God. And he helps them and he supports them all the way to heaven. Secondly, there is a responsibility upon us. It is to persevere. It is to strive daily down the narrow road which leads to life. But then thirdly and finally for us who are Christians, there is this matter of prayer. Prayer. Not just prayer for ourselves, but prayer for our brethren. You see, when Paul here says, God having begun a good work in you, we might read that individualistically, but the word you in Greek is plural. It's all of you. Oh, that's interesting. Uh-huh. Because it's a corporate salvation in that sense. Thus I say, beloved brethren, we are to corporately pray for all of our brethren, not just, oh, Lord, help me with this sin. Oh, Lord, help me that victory over this and that. But, Lord, help the whole church. Help the whole body, oh, God. Help each one, Lord, to strive, to repent to have faith in Christ. Oh God, give grace to each one. Give grace to this brother, to this sister. You know their struggles. You know their, their hardships, oh God. We must pray for the whole body. Because no temptation has taken a person except that which is common to man. And so let's pray for one another. God will keep you. God will keep me. God will keep all of us in the way of righteousness. Trials and, and temptations on every hand. The devil would love to pick us off, brethren, so we must pray to the great head of the church, oh Lord Jesus, keep us in the way. And when we fall out of the way, as it were, help us to repent, help us to confess and then help us to renew our love and our obedience to you. We must pray. And so may God help us in all of these regards. Well, I close then. This afternoon with a word to any non-Christian here this day. When I say non-Christian, I mean that you haven't been born again of the Spirit of God. You are not, as I said earlier, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so, in view of our passage for today, what can I say to you? You here, you children, you older folks, some of you, you who are not saved, what can I say to you but simply this? Listen, if you are ever going to know forgiveness with God, if you are ever going to know reconciliation with him, then you must plead with him that he would begin the good work of salvation in you. That's what you must do. You must do, as I read the passage last week, cry out with the, the tax collector, the, the publican, God be merciful to me, the sinner. Oh, you must plead with him that he would give you a new heart as he did Lydia so that you could believe on Christ alone for salvation. You must plead with him that he would make you a Christian. Am I saying God makes people Christians? Absolutely. And when God makes them Christians, he keeps them Christians all of their days. You must plead with God. God, since you are the author and the source 
and the initiator of salvation. Would it not please you to do that in me? Oh God, I, I beg that you would do this for me. Oh God, rend the heavens and, and take out my heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh. Oh God, make me a Christian. I understand the gospel. I understand that Jesus in love gave his life as a sacrifice for sinners like me. Oh God, give me a heart then to repent of my sins, to turn from them, and to put all my faith and confidence in Jesus' accomplishment at the cross. Help me to place the whole weight of my guilty soul upon his completed work where he died in the place room instead of the guilty and made a full, free, and final atonement to God for the sins of believing sinners. My dear non-Christian friend this day, plead with God that he, by his grace, would begin a good work in you, namely, the good work of salvation. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are dazzled and amazed and struck afresh with how good you are. That again, O oh God, although we often start things and don't finish them, you are not like us. You are not like the foolish builder that the Gospels speak about who, who, who planned on, on building a tower, but he never completed it. Oh God, when you plan to build something, you always complete it. And we thank you that you have begun the work of salvation in us, who are your people. You elected us from all eternity. You regenerated us in time, space, history. You justified us. You are sanctifying us. And one day, you will glorify us. And so, we bless your name. And we rest confidently in who you are and in what you are able to do. Encourage then your people with these thoughts. And for all of these things, we will praise and bless your most wonderful name. We ask them all in and through that exalted name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.